processional hymn can be found in the Pew Missal at hymn number 268, To Jesus Christ Our Sovereign King, hymn number 268. begin in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. With you Today, brothers and sisters, we're going to be beginning a new series, and it's called, I Thought Vatican II Changed All That. <laughs> and it's basically, um, we're going to be talking about a, a document from the Second Vatican Council called Sacrosanctum Concilium. You don't need to remember that, it's just the name of the document, but it's on the liturgy and what the church is calling us to in the, in the liturgy. So today we're going to do a little introduction. Well, um, for, for today, and then next week, we'll talk about the history of liturgical renewal, and then the uh, following week, we have a group of sisters coming to talk to us about for the mission appeal, which is gonna be wonderful, and then after that, we'll actually talk about the Second Vatican Council document. Sounds intriguing, right? <laughs> but it is a beautiful document, and there's a lot of real treasures in that document that will help us, I think, to grow in our appreciation of the Mass and our celebration of the Mass. And brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate these sacred mysteries. <clears throat> I confess to Almighty God and to my brothers and sisters that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth to people of good
Let us pray. O oh God, protector those who hope in you, without whom nothing has firm foundation, nothing is holy. Bestow in abundance your mercy upon us and grant that with you as our ruler and guide, we may use the good things that pass in such a way as to hold fast even now to those that ever endure. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the second book of Kings. A man came from Baal Shalijah, bringing to Elijah, the man of God, 20 barley loaves made from the first fruits and fresh grain in the ear. Elijah said, give it to the people to eat. But his servant objected, how can I set this before a hundred people? Elijah said, give it to the people to eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and there shall be some left over. And when they had eaten, there was some left over, as the Lord had said. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, I, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to live in a manner worthy of the call you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another through love, striving to preserve the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, one body and one spirit, as you were also called to the one hope of your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
prophet has risen in our midst. God has visited his people. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went across the sea. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs he was performing on the sick. Jesus went up on a mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. The Jewish feast of Passover was near. When Jesus raised his eyes and saw that a large crowd was coming to him, he said to Philip, where can we buy enough food for them to eat? He said this to test him, because he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, 200 days wages worth of food would not be enough for each to have, of them to have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter said to him, there is a boy here who has five lar barley loaves and two fish, but what good are these for so many? Jesus said, have the people recline. Now there was a great deal of grass in that place, so the men reclined, about 5,000 in number. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed them to those who were reclining, and also as much of the fish as they wanted. When they had had their fill, he said to his disciples, gather the fragments left over, so that nothing will be, will be wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 wicker baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves that had been more than they could eat. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, this is truly the prophet, the one who is to come into the world. So Jesus knew that they were going to come and carry him off to make him a king. He withdrew again to the mountain alone. The Gospel of the Lord. Good evening. Good evening. How's everybody doing? Well, two years ago, Pope Francis wrote a beautiful apostolic letter on the liturgy, on the, on the Mass, called Desiderio, Desiderio Desideravi, I think that's how you pronounce it in Latin, which basically means, I have earnestly desired, and it comes from the words of Christ at the Last Supper when he said, I have long desired, I have earnestly desired to share this Passover with you. And in this document from Pope Francis, he says something that should be so obvious, but sometimes we need to remind ourselves. And this is what he says in that document. And it was a document about the liturgy, about the Mass. He said, no one had earned a place to that supper. All had been invited. Now, it really seems self-evident, right? No one had earned a place at the table at that supper. All had been invited. And when we think about it, we remember that none of us has earned a place at the Lord's table and his altar. In fact, the Pope tells us we've been drawn here, and Jesus tells us that himself. We've been drawn here, called by the Lord himself to come and gather together. We don't just come, pull up our own chair, sit ourselves down, and take our rightful place where we belong. That's not what this is about. That's not what happens in the Mass. We've been called and drawn by God here, and we humbly approach him with thanksgiving for having been called. That's the attitude that we come to the Mass with. Now, if we're invited, and if God is the one that's called us together, drawn us together to stand before him, then he's the one in charge of what we do, right? Does that make sense to you? God is in charge. He's in charge of this assembly. And I say this for a very particular reason. You know, I grew up in the, in the 70s and 80s and a little bit in the 90s. And it was very popular during that time for different churches to get very creative with the Mass. And many of you probably lived through some of these experiments and some of these things. They would take all sorts of things, they'd make them up, and they'd just throw them into the Mass. So at times it seemed like the Mass became a competition of who could be the most creative and have the most creative kinds of Masses to go to. So you had many plays or dramas that would happen in the middle of the Mass where they'd act out different things. You would have clown masses or puppet masses. Anybody ever been to any of those? 
They had clown masses and puppet masses where even the priests were dressed like a clown. It really was a clown <laughs> for doing that. Uh, there'd be secular music that would be used. Like I remember, you know, and I know this because I was in the choir and I sang some of these secular hymns, music. Like Let It Be from the Beatles. I remember that was sung in the, in the mass. All sorts of things were brought into the mass. They had children's masses. Even today, some parishes still have these children masses where for some reason during the children mass, they throw the kids out and they go to another room and do something else because the kids are a distraction, which I don't, I don't understand, or the idea that, that the children can't understand everything that's going on so they don't belong in the Mass. They should be apart and then come back later on, something I've never believed in. I love having the kids here. And the babies, the little ones, they can make as much noise as they want. The adults, we have to be quiet, but the babies can do what they like. And sometimes during the Mass, there would be like little ballets, what they called liturgical dance, where people would dance down the aisle. That still, unfortunately, goes on in some places today, where a man or a woman or a group of people would dance down the aisle. This was just, there was just this general idea that we were in charge of the Mass, and that the beauty of the Mass depended on the creativity of the people preparing for that Mass. It was almost as if the Mass was supposed to be our own creation, something that we made up and did. And so priests and liturgical coordinators and youth ministers and whoever else, they would add things that they thought would make it meaningful or cute or more entertaining or more catechetical. And a lot of this was misguided but well-intentioned. Like I said, I was in some of those mini plays and I sang in the choir singing some of this music. It was all very well-intentioned very often. Sometimes, though, it was not so well-intentioned. It was just people's egos getting away with them. They wanted to be the, the star of the show that they were putting on during the Mass. All those things on their own outside of the Mass can be wonderful things to do, right? I don't really like clowns, though. Clowns kind of freak me out a little bit. <laughs> but clowns are, are great, I guess. And doing plays about scripture is a wonderful thing to do. And I love, I love the Beatles <laughs> and secular music and things. Just outside of the Mass, not during the Mass. They, there's something else. You see, the main problem with all of that is that, that the Mass and prayer are not our own creation. We don't create, out, create how we're going to worship God. God tells us how we're to worship Him. He's in charge of this assembly, not us. All we need to understand this is look back at Scripture. The whole witness of Scripture testifies to this reality, that God is the one that takes great care to explain to His people how He's to be worshipped. And this only makes sense, right? And why does it make sense? Because God is the only one like God who exists. There's no one and nothing else like Him. None of us can completely understand God fully or comprehend His awesomeness. We spend our whole life, right, hopefully all of us spend our whole life trying to get to know God more and more, to grow in our knowledge and our love of Him. And each day we can learn so much more about Him. And yet He's still a mystery to us, right? Don't you find that? The more we learn about God, the more of a mystery He is, a beautiful mystery. And this learning of Him and His remaining a mystery will continue for all eternity. In heaven, it will be a constant and a continual getting to know God and still realizing that He's so far beyond our understanding. We experience Him, we experience His love and His goodness, we experience His closeness to us, and yet He's so vastly beyond our reach. And there's no one or nothing completely like him. He's absolutely unique. And so how could we possibly know how to properly worship him? And there's a second reason why he has to show us how to worship him. He needs to show us because he knows that if he doesn't show us, we're going to get it all wrong. And we've proved it to him over and over again every time humans try to take the reins of worship into their own hands. And an erroneous and false worship leads to false belief because how we worship will become what we believe. And so false worship leads to false belief. False belief leads to error. And error leads to lostness, sin, and ultimately spiritual death. So worship is extremely important. It needs to be taken seriously and handled with care. 
We can see this clearly in the Old Testament. Just go back in the Old Testament and look at God's instructions for the building of just for these two things, the building of the temple and the style, the adornment of the priestly vestments that are to be used in temple worship. Every last detail, page after page after page, God reveals to Moses how the temple is to be built, how every cubit foot is to be designed, every decoration that's to be in it, how it's to be made, what it's to be made of, the colors and the styles of the priestly vestments, everything down to the last detail. God is meticulous when it comes to worship, and he meticulously instructs Moses, and Moses instructs the people. And this governed how the Jewish people were to worship. And when they failed to do this, when they started to take it all on their own initiative, when they failed to do it as God intended, we see what happens immediately after. They fell into er error, spiritual apathy, and then to paganism, sin, and finally, all of it was destroyed and lost. But we also see this in the New Testament. Jesus took a great deal of time teaching and showing the apostles how they were to pray and how they were to worship. Just look at St. John's Gospel and all the instructions that he gives at the Last Supper. And you can go back to what we're going to be getting to in a couple of weeks with this Gospel of St. John that we're going through right now, chapter 6. And some, <clears throat> some of what Jesus taught the apostles was handed on in writing, in the Gospels, in the letters of the Apostles, in St. Paul, in the book of Revelation. Look at that liturgy in the book of Revelation, how they worship in heaven. That's what we're supposed to be doing here. Look at how they worship in the book of Revelation. And the rest was taught and handed on from one generation to the next generation in the tradition of the church. It was handed on down through the generations. And the only one with the power to bind and loose that Jesus gives the power to bind and loose to is who in the church? Who has that power to bind and to loose? Who did Jesus say that to? St. Peter, right? Only Peter, the first pope, and the apostles united to him when they act with the pope. And this authority was handed on to all the popes and the bishops in union with him on down today to Pope Francis and all the bishops united with him. So why am I talking about all this? Because this is vital to understand as we begin the next series called, what I mentioned before, I thought the Second Vatican Council changed all that. The next few weeks we'll be talking about Sacrosanctum Concilium, the Second Vatican Council's document on the liturgy, and what it does and doesn't say about the renewal of the Mass. But before we dive into that, it's important to have the understanding that I just spoke about. The liturgy, the Mass, and worship is not our own creation. We don't design it. We receive it as a gift. Vatican II didn't create anything new or reinvent the Mass. The Pope and the bishops using scripture, tradition, history, and theology, they simply set out to discern how, how God has taught us to worship him, primarily through what God has revealed and developed among the Jewish people, what Christ himself taught and handed on to the apostles through scripture, and in the living reality of the church, and what has organically developed and been discovered by the church over time. Unfortunately, when a lot of people talk about the Second Vatican Council, very often they've never read or studied what the documents actually say. And so a lot of times I'll hear people say to me, they'll say, Father, didn't Vatican II change this or change that? Didn't they get rid of that or this? And I'm often like, uh, no. <laughs> no, they didn't change that. They didn't get rid of that. The Second Vatican Council did a lot of beautiful renewal, and we're going to talk about the authentic renewal, what it actually says, what the Second Vatican Council actually taught us. Now, just a word of why we're doing all this. You guys, everybody still with me? You still with me? All right, good. Why are we doing this? The main reason is that Pope Francis had declared this year of prayer in preparation for the Jubilee year next year, which happens every 25 years. It's a really special and beautiful time of, in the church, a time of great graces and renewal in the church. And so we declared this year as a year of prayer to prepare for that Jubilee year. So this year we're to focus on praying more and on diving deeper into prayer. Well, the highest and most beautiful and most powerful prayer, the most efficacious prayer, is that which the Lord himself has given us and taught us. It's a mass. 
There's no prayer we can ever pray that is greater or better or more glorious than the Mass, where Christ has called us together, where he's convoked us, where he's drawn us together with him and to enter with him to the gift of himself that he gives to the Father to enter once more into the mystery of his life, death, resurrection, his ascension, and his coming in glory. All of that is present when we celebrate the Mass. The whole mystery and the whole history of salvation is present here in one moment as we celebrate this Mass. It's not just something of the past, something of the present, or something of the future. All those things are present at this moment right now. Here the whole history and the future of salvation is made present to us as we stand with Christ before the gaze of the Father on the very threshold of heaven. Here the Son offers himself to the Father, and he offers us together with himself to the Father. And then he turns to us and he offers himself to us, feeding us with his own flesh and blood, his very self. There's no more beautiful, more sublime, more awesome, Thing than the Mass. None of us has earned this place, not you and not me. We've all been called, invited, and drawn here as a complete, gratuitous gift of God, and how gratuitous and blessed He's, he's made us. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things are made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and life of the world to come. Amen. Let us present our needs to our Heavenly Father. <coughs> For the intentions of our Holy Father, Pope Francis, our Bishop, David O'Connell, and for our priests and brothers, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the men and boys of our parish whom God is calling to be priests and brothers, especially in the Red Bank Oratory at St. Philip Neri, and for the women and girls whom God is calling to be sisters, that they have the courage to say yes to him, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Brother Zachary, Brother Anthony, and Brother James, who are in formation for the oratory, and for our diocesan seminarian, Brian, that the Lord give them the grace of joy and perseverance in their vocations. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For husbands and wives and widows and widowers, that they may lead their families to greater holiness and fidelity to Christ and his church. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the poor, the sick, and those in need, that the Lord may inspire in us new ways of serving him in them, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the deceased members of our families and parish, and for those who have no one to pray for them, that our prayers may accompany them as they are prepared for paradise, we pray to the Lord. 
Lord, hear our prayer. For the special intention of this Mass, for, for Marie Gutera and Daniel Scarpone, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, with faith and trust, we place all of our needs in your loving hands. We ask in your kindness and mercy that you please hear and answer us according to your holy will, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. There is a second collection today for the Priest Retirement Fund. Our offertory hymn can be found in the Pew Missal at hymn number 129. Father, we thank thee, hymn number 129. And at this time, we invite our children to bring their gifts to the altar. to God, our Almighty Father. Accept, O Lord, we pray, the offerings which we bring from the abundance of your gifts, that through the powerful working of your grace, these most sacred mysteries may sanctify our present way of life and lead us to eternal gladness. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, 
for in you we live and move and have our being. And while in this body we not only experience the daily effects of your care, but even now possess the pledge of life eternal. For having received the first fruits of the Spirit, through whom you raised up Jesus from the dead, we hope for an everlasting share in the Paschal mystery. And so with all the angels we praise you, as in joyful celebration we acclaim. By the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather people to yourself, that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, grace and make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. similar way when supper is ended he took the chalice and giving you thanks he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples saying take this all of you and drink from it for this is the chalice of my blood the blood of the new and eternal covenant which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins do this in memory of me Mysterium Fidei
celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven. And as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with our Holy Father, Saint Philip Neri, with Saint Anthony of Padua, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis our Pope and David our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, to whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace, I leave you my peace, I give you. Look not in our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grace you grant your peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed to those called to suffer of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy of you shut in my room, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Seventeenth Sunday of Ordinary Time can be found in the Pew Missal on page 223 with the readings, page, page number 223. Hymn number 181. 
let all mortal flesh keep silence. That's hymn number 181.
Let us pray. <clears throat> we have consumed, O Lord, this divine sacrament, the perpetual memorial of the passion of your Son. Grant, we pray, that this gift, which he himself gave us with love beyond all telling, may profit us for salvation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I just have a few announcements. Um, I don't know what they are. Let's see. Uh, RCI Teens, our program for high school students who would like to prepare for the sacraments, begins August 19th with a two-week retreat during the summer. Please register your children at this time. The re retreat during the summer is required before beginning classes in the fall. There is a parent and child meeting for the new students on August 17th at 515 in the parish center. This Wednesday is Desert Day. There will be adoration all day from 8 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. This Wednesday we'll have simple vespers and benediction. Next Wednesday we have, oh, uh, usually we have solemn vespers on the Desert Day, but we always do the, the solemn vespers on the first Wednesday, and we had to move Desert Day. So that's Desert Day is this Wednesday, and solemn vespers is at 6.30 the following Sunday. But we'll have simple vespers here in the church on Desert Day this Wednesday. This Friday is First Friday. We'll have adoration from 7 p.m. in the evening until 7 a.m. on Saturday. Youth, Junior, and Children's Oratory meet tomorrow night at 7 p.m. for Olympic Games and Ice Pops. And also uh, this weekend is grandparents and uh, is a special day for grandparents and the elderly. So we have a special blessing for the grandparents and the elderly. I won't say who's elderly, I'll let you decide. <laughs> so if you feel like, well, if you are a grandparent and you feel like you might be elderly, please remain, or you feel like you might be elderly, even if you're not a grandparent, please remain standing. Everybody else, oh, be seated. Well, happy Grandparents Day and happy day for the elderly. God bless you. It's a beautiful day because the, the Pope is trying to remind the world that as we get on in, in age, we, we have a lot to contribute to society, to the community, to the church, that there, you know, especially for Christians, there is no retirement. Our retirement will come for most of us at Mount Olivet. That's where we get to, re, that's where we get to retire when, we, when the Lord carries us home to heaven. In the meantime, the Lord calls us to share all that we've learned throughout the years with, with all of his children and to participate in the life, in the full life for the church. And so bow down and pray for God's blessing. Lord Jesus, you were born of the Virgin Mary, the daughter of Saints Joachim and Anne. Look with love on grandparents the world over. Protect them. They are the source of enrichment for families, for the church, and for all of society. Support them as they grow older. May they continue to be for their families strong pillars of gospel faith, guardians of noble domestic ideals, living treasures of sound religious traditions. Make them teachers of wisdom and courage, that they may pass on to future generations the fruits of their mature human and spiritual experience. Lord Jesus, help families and society to value the presence and the role of grandparents and the elderly. May they never be ignored or excluded, but always encounter respect and love. Help them to live serenely and to, be, to feel welcomed in all the years of life which you give them. Mary, mother of all the living, keep grandparents and the, and the elderly constantly in your care. Accompany them on their earthly pilgrimage. And by your prayers, grant, all, grant that all families may one day be reunited in our heavenly homeland, where you await all humanity for the great embrace of life without end. Amen. And please stand. The Lord be with you. Thank you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks. Thanks be to God. Our recessional hymn can be found in the Pumas, hymn number 163, I Sing the Mighty Power of God, hymn number 163. Spread love. 
Yeah. Yes. Huge. 